Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Wheeler Centre tonight on this uh, miserable, cold, rainy night. Um, I'm Ramona Koval, and I promise your evening is about to be deeply enriched and warmed by the presence of this man here, this writer, Richard Flanagan. His new novel is The Narrow Road to the Deep North, um, bringing to life a period in Australian history that I don't think has been well expressed in novelistic form, although there have been noted war memoirs from survivors of the Japanese Imperial Army's POW camps that were ordered to build the Thai Burma Railway. Heroism, goodness, mateship, war, enemies, class, memory, self-delusion, passion, guilt, honour, love, loyalty. These are just some of the ideas that are swirling around this major work. Richard Flanagan has brought the silence of what happened in the POW camps to the pages of this novel that tells a story from many points of view, including those who held the Australian prisoners captive. He writes of everything that went on there with clarity and poetry. It's a novel of which I think, Richard, you can be justly proud. Um, please welcome Richard to Melbourne. Thank you. Well, this book is dedicated to prisoner San Biaku San Jugo, in brackets 335, which I assume is your father's prisoner identification number. It, it was my, um, my father's number, and it was, uh, it was a number um, myself and my brothers and sisters grew up with. Um, because my father, unlike many of the POWs, used to talk to some extent um, of what had happened in the camps. Uh, when I came to write this novel, which has been 12 years in the writing for me, uh, I chose the title, The Narrow Road to the Deep North, which I'm sure many of you will know is the, uh, the title um, of one of the most famous works of Japanese literature written by the great haiku poet Basho in the 17th century. Um, my father's experience and that of his mates was one of the low points of uh, Japanese civilization. And I wanted to use something of the forms and um, techniques and ideas of um, these high points of Japanese um, culture to explore this, this, this very low point. What did your father say about his time in the camps? I mean, how did he use his number? How come all the kids knew the number? Well, he used to laugh a lot, and he'd just laugh, and, um, you know, it was a joke, you know, San Biaco, San Jigo. He told, his stories he told us were funny stories, um, but they're always tinged with a, a pathos and, uh, and, and a great humanity. But they weren't stories of horror and they weren't stories of hate. Um, I can't remember when I first heard many of the stories. I mean, you, in that way, you do have stories as a family. You grow up with them and over time, um, like a seed that grows into a tree of exotic fruit, they start to acquire more and more strange meaning to you. And I guess I've been turning these stories over in my mind ever since I first heard them as a, as a little kid in the kitchen. Were you, um, did you... Did you wonder about whether you'd measure up to your father in terms of him surviving such an ordeal? Did you wonder what it might have been like if you were there? Um, he never... He never made us feel that way. Um, he, didn't, he didn't present it as heroism. He, he presented it as um, love and fraternity and, and humour, you know, uh, what people have and do when every other vestige of humanity is stripped away from them. Um, the only thing that we grew up having to measure up to was you... you you, it mattered to him not your achievements, but how you treated other people, the people you're at school with, the people um, who, who lived around you. 
and how you treated the, the poorest and weakest. That's what mattered, and, um, and that's how we measured you, and that's how you had to measure up. How did you go about... Oh, sorry, I should give you... An, that, that won't make, I'll give you an example of this. Um, I won a Rhodes Scholarship. I went over to tell my parents, I uh, see my mum, I say, um, I won a Rhodes Scholarship. She said, my father was pretty old even by then, and he said, she said, you better go down and see your, your father and tell him. He was down in the backyard turning the compost. I went down there and... Um, I said, Dad, I've got some news for you. He, he didn't bother turning around. He said, what is it? I said, um, oh, well, I've, I've won this scholarship, the Rhodes Scholarship. And he said, if you should meet with triumph or disaster, treat these two imposters just the same. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, OK. <laughs> well, that was, you know, and he was right. It wasn't a big thing, you know, and... Uh, but when I had hard times, and I've had plenty of those, and when I've had defeats and failures, and I've had plenty of those, as everyone has had, he made me realise they were illusions too. And um, so that's, that's the sort of bloke he was, and I think he acquired all that from the experience of the camps. You write about um, his character, D Dorigo? Yeah, Dorigo. Evans. And he is an amalgam of you know, many kinds of stories that we've, we've heard from the camps. Um, uh, he is a, a doctor who leads the men. Um, uh, and he comes from um, a background where he learns about the, uh, the great heroic mythic stories in classical literature. Um, he reads the Greeks. You know, he adores those, those stories. Um, what does he learn about heroism? What does he think about heroism before he's tested? Oh, well, I have no idea what he thinks. I mean, one of the strange things when you go out with a book is um, people want the writer to give judgments on um, character and story and so on. But uh, really... As Chekhov wrote to his brother in a letter, it is um, the writer's job to report on a character's actions and thoughts and words, and it is for God and the reader to judge. And when you write a novel, and after you've written several, you discover that whatever you thought the character was, um, read it. if the novel succeeds, readers will have all sorts of different opinions about them. You know, some people will see Dorigo Evans, will read it and see him as a hero. Some will see him as um, a sham and um, a, a fraud. And that, to me, is as it should be, because that's what happens to us in life. You know, people have all sorts of judgments of us. And a novel has to represent that truth of life, that essential chaos and uncertainty. And uh, we, when we spectate upon it, draw mostly completely inaccurate and erroneous judgments. Yeah, that's one answer. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you're going to be tricky. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you're right, but Dorigo actually reads, reads the Greek myths and you've actually reported that he does. And he, um, he, uh, he also wants to find this sort of book that expresses everything, he says. He's, he's a romantic when it comes to, to books and, and what's in them. And, you know, I'll respect what you're saying and I won't go into your characters too much well, I, then. I, th I think it's interesting how Dorigo is a character who's fascinated with words. Um, he says, as my father, who was the son of two illiterate, said to me when I asked him why he loved poetry, which he used to recite all the time, he said because in my world there was no art, no music, and words, the written word, was the first beautiful thing I ever saw, or the first beautiful thing I ever knew, I think is what he said, which is a line I use in the book and give to Dorigo. And Dorigo simply absorbs literature without judgment, um, till in the end the, 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 I write how he has become a poem. I mean, essentially, he, he's particularly enamoured of Tennyson's Ulysses, as many people of his generation were. And uh, in the end, he simply feels that 
that poem and his life have become one. And I think that art does have that transformative power for some people's soul when they um, absorb it without judgment, but through um, the prism of the experience of all the extraordinary things that life gives us all. Well, he recognises the power of reading early in his life, and I guess... You know, you've already mentioned Basho and and uh, the idea of these haiku and and the the poems that uh, describe journeys in nature that are, are the high point um, of of Japanese culture. But what do we say about those great literary cultures of Japan and Germany and their inability to resist the brutality of the other side the, of of what happens in those wars? Um, what of culture then? What good is culture if it, it also um, can, well, live alongside this, that sort of bestiality, I suppose? I mean, isn't this one of the big questions? Well, it's a, it's a <coughs> question to which I have no answer, you know. Uh, I mean, culture alone is never a, a defence and... Um, and should never be regarded as making one superior in terms of humanity. But when you were reading this book, reading for this book, and you were reading Japanese poetry, you were trying to get inside it, weren't you? You were trying to, weren't you trying to work out how, how the POW camps and Basha could exist in the same place? I, I wasn't. Uh, I'm, I wasn't so bravely ambitious. I just was... Um, it, within every human breast, there is, exists uh, the universe and contained within each of us is infinite love and, and the most murderous impulses. Um, and the Japanese, the Germans, us, we are all the same in this... You know, we, we contain the beauty of Basho and the horror of the death railway. That surely that's the point, that we are capable of both things. Um, I went to Japan, when I'd nearly finished the novel in uh, December last year, I went to Japan to meet with um, uh, guards who'd worked on the, the death railway. And um, uh, shortly, well, about five minutes before I met one, um, I realised he was actually the man who the Australians in my father's camp, which was Weary Dunlop's camp, um, knew as the lizard, and he was the, the Ivan the Terrible of that camp. He'd been sentenced to death for war crimes after the war. Um, he was the only man my father ever spoke of with violent intent, and, and Dunlop records in his diary how he waited with a rock to kill him. Uh, and on that particular day, the lizard didn't take this particular path he normally took. The lizard had his um, sentence commuted and then he was released in a general amnesty in 1956. Um, he was a Korean. He actually went on to form an association of um, uh, ex-Korean war criminals with the marvellous slogan, um, which we will recognise in Australia, of moving forwards. <laughs> um, <laughs> at the, um, I think Mussolini had that one as well. <laughs> But the, so five minutes before I'm to meet them, because the Death Railway was a, um, a vast project over a quarter of a million people, I hadn't expected to meet someone from my father's camp, far less the lizard, who I didn't even know was still alive and who was now going by his Korean name. And I met him in this um, office of a, his son's taxi company in an outer suburb of Tokyo. And um, I met a, a, a genial... Um, courteous and generous old man who, who wished to try and um, atone um, for his past, although he couldn't quite name his past completely, although he was um, vague on some of the details of the past of the camps. But nevertheless, there was something genuine in his intent. And, and of all, I, I was completely undone you know, to know I was to sit in a room with this man. What and did you know about him before that? What did you know that he'd done? What stories did you know about him? 
My, my father, who was a gentlest man, said that he dreamt of bayoneting him again and again for what he had done to the other men. I mean, and the, the, there's a thing in the book which my father told him, draping his intestines around him. And so that, that this is just not, my father was, I mean, I'd feel that I slightly betray him telling that story, but that's, I don't know what he did. I know every man, if you, from that, that camp, if you mention the lizard, um, so, um, uh, so an earthquake, when, when you approach him, that what, how, when you he say was a, he was generous and well, he, he was, was just a genial old man. Um, uh, an earthquake hit Tokyo. A seven point three Richter scale earthquake hit Tokyo after I've been in this room with him for about half an hour. So the whole taxi company sways back and forth like a dinghy on a wild sea and and I, the one thing I knew was that wherever evil was it wasn't in that room with us and I didn't go to him in a spirit of accusation or a spirit of um, uh, in, of that sort of uh, you know I wasn't there for vengeance I was there because I wished to know his story and his story was that he grew up in occupied Korea um, his family suffered a lot of brutality um, he, he was essentially press ganged into being a guard at the age of 15 and um, he went off to a training camp where they were beaten remorselessly and uh, there's a detail in the book where they were they would line all these Korean recruits up um, in two rows and they had to slap each other on the face and I got him to slap me to show me how they did it and you had to slap and slap and as hard as you could. And on the first day, he um, he entered into a deal, whispered a deal with the bloke opposite him that they go soft on each other. And the Japanese officer who was overseeing the training came up and um, beat him as hard as he could round his kidneys with a steel rod so that he pissed blood that night. And he said, the next day, I um, I hit the man opposite me as hard as I could. Um, I mean, you have to sort of try and understand that. You have to understand how they were trained. You have to understand how societies um, teach people that goodness and a lack of empathy are the same thing. And we've seen that in Australia when, you know, we have the cruel to be kind policies with refugees. You know, the, the, these things are a slow path over decades that finally can lead to great evil being done by people who in other circumstances aren't evil. So what did he think you were there for? Um, I, I, I don't know that. I, I, think, um, I think people have a profound spiritual sense when they've done wrong. <coughs> And I think um, they know that at some point, you know, it's the corpse floating back up in the, the bog. At some point, these people come back to you. I met a, a man who'd been a health orderly at my father's camp who remembered the Australians crawling around like skeletons in the mud. Um, I met, he ended up a slave labourer south of Hiroshima in a, a coal mine under the inland sea and uh, I met guards from there. Everyone said sorry. And you, ca you have to take that in the, that spirit. They, they're willing to meet with you. They say sorry. And when I returned, uh, within a few hours, I returned to Australia, my father rang up and asked me what had happened. And I told him that I felt people carried a shame and a guilt. And although they, were, they weren't fully owning up to things, I felt it was genuine. And... Um, he suddenly couldn't talk, and which was unlike him, and hung up the phone. And um, he, he was getting very old and frail by then, and um, he was 98. And um, uh, later that day, his mind was still very sharp, but he lost all memory of his prisoner of war experience. And it was as if he were finally free. When did you start writing this book? Uh, I, I think um, 
about 2001 when I finished Gould's Book of Fish. Um, and I've been trying to write it ever since, and I, I tried to write it in all sorts of ways. I tried to write it as a novel of linked haiku. I tried to write it as a high bun, which is the original form of the narrow road to the deep north, a sort of travel journal. I, I tried to write it as a vast sort of epic with, with um, crowds, um, a family epic, and each of these novels I wrote then threw away. Did you complete each of them? I did, yeah, but none of them were right. And, and then I realised my father was growing very old and frail. And I, I, I guess James Baldwin said of Go Tell It on the Mountain um, that it was a book he had to write if he was ever to write another book. And I realised I had to do this thing now. And I, I think I had to write all my other books in order to learn how to write this because this, this was a very technically difficult book and it was a book that I had to have... I, I, I got one of those silly sidebar questionnaires the other day I had to do and they said how did you research this I said and I just wrote I lived <laughs> uh, you, you have to experience a certain amount of life before you can take on these things I think I... when you um write it as a, a series of haiku and write it you know, in, in other kinds of literary forms what are you trying to do with that are you trying to inhabit the the poems of the other side, or are you trying to inhabit the mindset of the culture that you're trying to write about? What I'm just trying to understand the writer tra creating a structure like that. Look, I, mean, I, I know these are very unsatisfactory answers, but the more I write, the less I know about writing. I mean, um, <laughs> I, uh, let's try. I, 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 um, I simply feel these things are the way to go. I, when I started writing, I, I knew so much about it, and um, and now I know nothing. I just uh, wake up and try and. I, I did a gig years ago with Annie Prue in San Fran in LA, and it was this. There were two thousand earnest Californians come to see Annie Prue. I would think, <laughs> and um, and. Uh, the moderator through to Annie Prue first said, how do you research your novels? And, and she's a very nice woman, but she's in that North American way very industrious and she moves to an area like, you know, um, uh, the Maritimes or Wyoming or wherever and she sets up databases and research projects and goes to public records office and, you know, archives and the way she indexes and does... And uh, look, she went on for 15 minutes. It was utterly exhausting just... <laughs> listening to her and, and people were very impressed and then they threw to me and they said, how do you research? And I said, I get up and make, I said, I'm Australian, um, we're, we're not so inclined to that, I get up each morning and make it up. <laughs> and, and the really awful thing was, you laugh, but no one laughed, 2,000 earners <laughs> just stared at me and uh, I, I was, um, I wished, I wished to fall through the earth back to Australia at that point, yeah. But um, you, but you so, did... So why did I do it? I don't know why. It just felt right <coughs> until, I realized, until I realised it didn't work. And I think that's... You, I wish I was a writer who learnt from what they did and could um, have a clever idea and write it up in a year because this is obviously a very foolish and stupid and time-wasting way, but... Um, that's that's how I arrived at it. Um, but something happened. You thought my dad's getting very old. I've got to just start again and do it. Yeah. Do it. And yet, properly th there is something. a lot of each of those previous novels in, in this it. final yeah, exactly. one. You, yeah. you know it, that that was necessary. Um, it was um, a hell of a long time, <laughs> but it was necessary. You said you didn't do research, but you did go and um, go and walk some of the the Thai Burma Railway, didn't you? Yeah, I went back to the railway with, um, uh, with my brother and um, my brother Tim. Um, and we, Dad at that age, he was still, that was about 10 years ago, and uh, we asked him if he wanted to come. He said, oh, he said, I was lucky to get out of there once. He said, I'm not bloody going back. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so you I, and Tim go. Yeah. And... Um, you, do you ask him a lot of questions, your dad a lot of questions beforehand, so you know what to be looking for? Well, I, 
I just, um, no, I didn't ask him much before, not at all, because um, it, I, we were so thoroughly full of it. We just, not that he'd forced it on us, but um, it was part of our life, as, as the Holocaust is with your family. You know, you, you, you don't have to research specifically Treblinka to know a lot about it already, you know. Um, but when, I, when in the final stage, well, not the final stages, the last couple of years, I did spend a lot of time with my father um, just talking about both very simple things, um, you know, how, um, what, what the actual hoes were like, how they sharpened the chisels, um, you know, what size were the qualies they cooked in, um, how do you burn a cholera corpse, what, what was the cholera compound actually like? Um, and also very abstract things. Um, what is love? You know, what is war? What is death? You know, so the, the novel was a way of being with my father. When you and your brother were, were doing that trip, um, how did it affect you? Did you... It was hot and it was hard and you could imagine what it was like for them when they were so hungry and so overworked and so desperate and ill. I just tried to not um, think. I tried to just open myself up to, to absorb as much as I could because I knew I'd have to draw on it for years after. So I tried to open my senses up to the sharpness of Thai bamboo, um, the particular size of the wasps, um, the strange um, bunion-like hills that ran down the, the River Kwai, um, the nature of the forest, um, the clefts in the limestone and how um, your feet would walk on them if they were bare. Um, and I tried not to think beyond those things. Do you make a lot of notes when you do these things or is it just you just think whatever I'm going to remember is the important part. No, yeah, I think that's right, I, because I think um, we, we are extraordinary in that we have an extraordinary capacity to absorb. And when you take notes or you take photos, you deny yourself um, and rob yourself of that capacity. And or you, you still have it, but you're ignoring it and willfully dismissing it. But when you come home with only what is in your soul, um, and allow that to, uh, to be fallow for a time, after a time there will be an enormous um, harvest that you will be able to take from it. Um, we've talked a lot about war, but the book is also about love and um, about different kinds of love. Um, you know, love between mates and love between men and women and um, passionate love and... Uh, long married love. Um, why was it important to have this strand of love through this book? Well, I, I think um, each alone the other, that, that love, love stories are about death, you know, because we, we understand that love, we, we understand we glimpse the infinite and the universe in love, but we also know that ultimately it's ephemeral you know, that, that it lasts an hour, a week, a month, maybe a couple of years. And, and so there's this strange paradox about love, and that's why all great love stories are also about death. So I think war illuminates love, and love um, allows us... Um, is it... A, uh, I'm trying to think, is it Auden? It's not Auden. It's Yeats, Yeats who wrote, We Cannot Stand Too Much Reality. And, and if you were to write about a reality so terrifying, you must have something that balance it, uh, balances it spiritually and uh, in the sake, for the sake of a novel artistically. But I, I, um, I'd always been very taken by a story my parents used to tell of a Latvian man who um, lived in Longford in Tasmania, where we're from, and he had immigrated there after the war. His story was that immediately after the war he'd gone back to his village which had been completely destroyed and his wife was dead. Um, and he didn't believe his wife was dead and he searched for her everywhere. 
And he then searched that um, vast, um, desolate world that was post-war Europe for her um, for two years. And in the end, he had to accept she was dead. And he immigrated to Australia and ended up in Longford, um, married an Australian woman and had children to her. Um, in 1957, he went to Sydney and he was walking down a street in Sydney and he saw walking um, down the pavement towards him his Latvian wife with a child on either hand. And he had a few moments to decide whether um, he would acknowledge her or whether he would walk on, whether he would um, end his life he had, um, whether he would destroy her life, whether it was possible or not, he had to, or whether he would ignore her. And he had three or four seconds to make that, that singularly extraordinary choice. And, and this most beautiful story haunted me because I thought it tells, it, it, in it is everything about um, the, the love of men and women, the love of family, um, and um, the, the, the choices we have to make. And so I built the whole novel out. That was the image I had from the beginning that was, to me, the, the, the centre of the novel. The story about the Latvian man, what did he do in the story? Well, you, 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 you would have to read the novel. Excuse me, Richard, I have read the novel. Oh, now, I've read now you say, Ramona. Every word of the novel. <laughs> no, I know no. what happens in your novel, yeah. but I thought we're not allowed to talk about your novel. No, no. So I'm trying to talk about the man whose story that you heard when you heard it. Well, it's the same story. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we know. You, read, you and I know. And you'll right? know when you, you read it. Yeah. But Dorigo, you know, he's an interesting character because he's um, heroic in many senses and yet he's got this um, complication. He's, he's had an affair with a woman who um, is, um, you know, a great love, um, not his wife, somebody else's wife. And then he has a dutiful marriage afterwards and, um, and a long marriage, and lots and lots of affairs and lots and lots of peccadilloes and sexual relationships. Um, uh, he, he seems, but, but of which he's kind of ashamed as well. Um, so I'm just interested to know what you're saying there about that kind of love and you know, the dutiful marriage and, and the, the long connection. And there, there's actually a, another lovely scene in the book where um, the wife of a man who's died in the camps is visited by Dorigo and um, he brings some medals back for her. And just his afternoon that he spends there um, tells us such a lot about um, the sort of great respect he has for this, this love, this relationship, this real coupling, I suppose. Um, can you talk about this, this kind of coupling which you're interested in? Well, I, there's a line at the end of the book that says love is um, two bodies sharing one soul. Um, I used to collect love stories from people and ask them to tell me their love story. And, and one of the, you, you hear many quite surprising and um, sometimes lurid and um, wonderful things. You hear some very sad things. One is some people never know love, you know. Some are lucky enough to know it a couple of times. Most people might know it once and it's often transitory. So with him, his great love is, um, one woman. Um, but that doesn't mean he's, there's, there's not love elsewhere. And in a way, his life is an odyssey trying to discover, you know, where his Ithaca of love is and what it is. And that's, he looks at love with all these other people trying to discover if that is real love, if what he has now is love, what he had then is love. Um, that's really the journey of his life. There's a, um, also one of the lines in the book that has 
as a man in the camps, I think he's finding a beautiful flower. And, and he says something like he believes that there are vitamins in, in, beauty. in beauty. Yeah. I like that. That, that there was n sustenance in beauty. Is, is that why poetry is so important for people in prisons and in, in uh, camps? And, you know, you do, you do read about the importance of somebody remembering some wonderful line somewhere. Um, well, I think that, that the one character says they're vitamins in beauty and the other one says, oh, I thought there were vitamins in vitamins. Um, so I, uh, both things are true, aren't they? I mean, the, I think the thing about a novel is it's not an argument for anything. Um, a novel like life is incon inconsistent. It doesn't have a fixed position, finally. Um, I think for some people, um, art can sustain them. Um, for others, it can't. But there, there, there were numerous cases. Ray Parkin, whose war memoirs are the most remarkable any Australian's produced, he clearly is an example of a man sustained by his belief in art and poetry. Um, but um, I, I don't think it can be taken as a given that it is for all, or could be for all. And in the end, they died not for want of um, poetry, but for want of food. Mm. So when you put the final touches to this book, um, I mean, how did, you, how did you get to the finishing line? Was it a great struggle for you? Um, well, it, yeah, it was... Uh, um, my, uh, my father was growing very ill and... Um, uh, I finished what was the, the final draft and um, uh, was called in. Uh, he was in a home by this point. He'd only been there a couple of months. He was very ill and he asked me how the book was going. I, I said that it was finished and he'd always been very good about the novel because he understood... He was happy that there was a book being written about the prisoner of war experience because he feared it would be forgotten. But he gave me complete freedom to write what I wanted. He never asked me what the story was. That wasn't, he trusted me that it would not dishonor the memory of all his friends who died up there. Um, so I told him it was finished. And, and although the, the, the events aren't related at all, um, he, he died that night and uh, it, it wasn't quite true because there were final revisions which always are much more work than they seem and I really only finished those he died about uh, two days before Anzac Day and then um, uh, I had to return to finish the revisions um, I finished them about six weeks ago you know, uh, and the book went straight off to the printer and um, and really I had nothing left in me. Um, I, it was very cold in Tasmania and I, I just sat by the fire and I just stared at the flames for a good two weeks. I, could, I had nothing to, to say, to think. I haven't really read since then. Um, I, I, I felt I put everything I, I knew into this book and felt, more importantly. It's an ordeal to go on the road with a book like this, isn't it? It, it is for me. I, and I, I, with the greatest respect, it's a, a, a charade um, because um, in the end, uh, the book is... It, it, it's not fallacious to say it, it is what readers make of it. Readers tell you far more interesting things and find, if you've succeeded, they find what is of interest and worth. And it is in that beautiful moment of communion when a reader loves a book and grants it the authority of their life and their experience and their soul that a book becomes alive. And I always feel everything I say betrays what I was really trying to do when I wrote the book. I did a tour of America for Death for River Guide, which was published 
years after it had been published here and um, I had a panic attack halfway across the Pacific because I couldn't remember what the book was about. And um, <laughs> I landed in a, I, I drank my way through to LAX in a, in a spirit of increasing sort of terror and alcoholic dissipation. And well, on landing, the, my publicist was there in a state of high excitement because she had a, an interview lined up with um, a nationally syndicated radio program that was very highly regarded. And the only catch was we had to do it immediately. <laughs> So, so, so with a, a shocking hangover and jet lag and um, panic, she drove me to this radio station in Los Angeles and um, we went in and um, this wonderful North American told me what Death of a River Guide was about <laughs> for an hour. And um, I agreed, it was the most marvellous interview I'd ever had and <laughs> went round America parading these ideas of the American journalists as my own and was... Um, People thought they were terrific. You even told me what the characters' names were. And, um, yeah, so that's... I, it, it's, it's an important thing to do and a necessary thing, and I'm, I'm very grateful for everyone coming and, uh, and very grateful to you. Um, but in the end, there, there are the, the words on the page, and, um, and that's what you give of yourself. I, I always think that the modern cult of the author's strange, you know, like, like Kafka probably would have had a squeaky voice. Faulkner did. I met a woman who had heard Faulkner said he had a terribly squeaky voice, mm. you know. There's some uh, recordings, I think. Of yeah. yeah. Um, we, you know, we, we now want the books, but we want the authors to, to entertain us, to enlighten us. And, and there's a return of this dreadful idea of novels as moral grammars, that they will give us instruction, that they will tell us how to live. And they don't. At their best, they they do offer us the solace that um, in, in everything that is best and worst about us, we're not alone. And, and that to me seems um, a fairly large and remarkable thing. It is. Um, why don't you ask some questions now? Um, there's some microphones around. Um, put your hand up and then we'll get your microphone. Hi. Um, you just said that you don't remember Death of a River Guide, so, um, but I did read an interview about that book and you said, you talked about the technical difficulties that you had with that book and you've said again you had technical difficulties with this book and I guess you break a lot of rules in your writing. There's one page in Death of a River Guide where you move from first person present tense to third person past tense um, and I was just, which is brilliant, it's brilliant, but... Um, I was just wondering if there's how you confronted the naysayers, if there were any, and dealt with those difficulties, technical difficulties. Um, oh, well, I, I just think a novel ought to be novel, and that um, I think Flann O'Brien writes in that Swim Two Birds, um, one beginning and one ending is something I've never agreed with in any book, and particularly not in that order. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I think um, reality is so extraordinary that the worst way you can deal with it is realistically. Um, and so it demands of the novel that it be as unexpected, as strange, and as, um, uh, and as rich as life is, it's, as life is itself. Um, how do I deal with the technical problems? Um, well, I, I, I think... Um, they are the things that often drag out the best response in you as a writer. I think when you're writing, when you know what you're writing, you're writing nothing worth reading. Good point. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> but Is also, that... I, I just on that point too, because earlier when we were talking, I was talking to Richard about some of the passages that I thought were, you know, it's a wonderful book. Um, but to be right in the camps and in the sickness and in the mud and in the death and in the death and in the death and in the death, um, to keep writing and keep the reader on an edge of the seat while we're actually going through repeated, um, repeated deaths, I suppose. And you talked about... Um, using similar language or using the same words again and again, which would be frowned upon by an editor, but you you insisted that this was a way to get through it. Is that? Can you talk about that? 
Well, it's, uh, you know, you you start off with high aesthetics and end up with low cunning. And, um, <laughs> you, 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 you know, Tolstoy um, used repetition um, in a way that's very frowned upon in high modernist prose, but which gives you a closeness to story because it gives you the rhythms of everyday speech. Um, uh, so if you repeat an adverb two or three times in a key paragraph, it will just ease the reader through it. And if it's done artfully, they won't notice the repetition, but they will feel much closer to the story. Um, the sequence that uh, Ramona was talking about was a sequence where I just want to get this overwhelming sense of death. Now, uh, again, the, the classic, you know, post-war way of dealing with that is just to have a sentence like that, um, you know, the overwhelming sense of death. But um, I, I used a sort of reverse Molly Bloom soliloquy style where I just slowly build up a, a, a pattern with the word um, death, 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 dead, death, dead, death. And it has to, in the end, it has to be musical because the composition of novels is, uh, and the, the, that earlier question about technical difficulties and so on, the composition of novels is much closer to that of music than it is to um, what people might think of as narrative. And it has to have complex a, a complex musical architecture to succeed because people are attuned to patterns and rhythms and a, a great novel has those done incredibly skillfully. Um, Milan Kundera writes very well on this. His father was a composer. I think he had more insight into it than most people but uh, I think a lot of great novelists do it unconsciously but they are very musical in composition. Mm. Another question. Now, come on. But that, that's looking very Californian all of a yeah, sudden. No, uh, just... Yes. Yeah. It seems uh, you might be a good soulmate to Bob Dylan, I think, the way you've spoken as well. I'd be interested to know what your dad's colleagues or his uh, friends or, or people might have gone through this situation might have thought about the book, but obviously with his advanced age, there's no way to answer that. But I'll ask another level question like that. Your brother, uh, who went through this experience with you growing up, hearing these stories from your dad and then visited the place with you, what's, what was his feeling when he saw the product, saw the book that you produced? Well, it was, you know, it was a, it was a difficult... I, I feel you have to be... Well, I've always felt I have to be completely free to write as I wish. For the first time, that was complicated for me because I felt it had to be whatever I wished it to be, but I did not want um, anyone who'd lived through it to feel that it demeaned them, and um, I did not w wish any of my... I'm one of six, any of my brothers or sisters to feel that um, uh, it somehow got the truth of what happened. I mean, obviously, it's it's a completely different story to that of my father, but the, the truth of it had to ring true. Um, and I guess I just had to trust my instincts. Near the end, I, I, um, I had one brother and one sister had them read it, um, and they both said it was OK. So that, that, that I was hugely relieved. Now, I don't know what I would have done if they hadn't thought that. I don't normally think this way about a novel because it, you can't... You, you have to answer only to yourself normally with a novel. But um, th this was complex for me. Uh, uh, what the old diggers think of it, I, I don't know. Um, I, I hope um, they feel that it's honoured the memory, although it's very clearly a fiction. And there's a... Yes, a, oh, a couple of people there. You're getting warmed up now. You're getting warmed up, yep. Uh, <laughs> on your realism point, I, I haven't read the novel, but I just looked at it in a bookshop and I see that in the front you acknowledge that you've used, a, uh, even verbatim, some of the other work that's been written by people like Weary Dunlop, etc., etc. I'm just wondering how much you... Ha <laughs> How that that affected how you how you fictionalised uh, the fact that you were 
referring, and people obviously know that there are these well-known figures that do appear and have written about what you're writing about. Um, so the question is really, how do you how, how do you reconcile that with what you're writing as a novel? Well, no, I don't. Um to uh, to correct you, I don't say that I use verbatim anything of Weary Dunlop's. I refer to several the writings of several people who um, I've used elements of story. So I don't want anyone to think all the stories are invented. Elements of them come from the writings of some of those people and the stories I grew up with with my father. I use verbatim, I use close to verbatim about half a page of um, an account by Kevin Fagan, who was another well-known doctor up there who was a Tasmanian, and, um, and so I acknowledge that, of course. But um, the stories are, uh, you know, vivisected and then put back together with other stories, and so you, you have this burden these days where, you, you know, people, um, you, you have to be very upfront about where some things have come from or people will accuse you of, um, you know, defiling other writings. But at the same time, um, it, it's not taken verbatim other than that one half page. So, so it didn't really affect me. Those writings I'd read years ago, some of the stories stayed. Um, some of them got used in different ways. It's not much different than Shakespeare using Holinshed for his chronicles, for his plays. Every writer, every writer reads and the readings um, end up influencing what they write. Um, the original acknowledgements there talked about, which I, I just cut down to fit it in the page, but it also talked about all the novels, dreams, nightmares, songs and paintings that had been such a profound influence on the book but it was redundant because they are on any book for any writer. Mm. Yep. Hi. I don't, um, I don't wish to pry into your relationship with your father too much, but do you feel comfortable sharing how he felt about you shining a spotlight on this, both his experience and then going, walking the trail and meeting the, um, the Japanese guards? Do, do I feel comfortable talking about it? Do, do you mean? Or? Sorry, I wanted to know how your father felt about you shining that light on those aspects. I think he felt it was necessary. Um, and I think he felt um, it, it, it's simply something that had to happen. Uh, if you mean how did he feel about me going to Japan, do you mean? Or? Yes. He was very worried. Um, he was frightened about it. Um, he was frightened for me, you know. He, he also... Um, he also wished me to meet the Japanese people as they are now. We were brought up very strongly to believe these things were cultural, not racial, that they were a consequence of a history, uh, not of genetics or anything like that. Nevertheless... He, he was frightened when I was there. I mean, that's understandable, I would think. Uh, uh, and I would have to say, I only met with the greatest courtesy, civility and kindness with, from all the Japanese people I met with. There's a few more hands up. Thank you. Hello, Richard. Um, yeah. I was lucky enough to know your dad. And... Um, I know his, um, one of his mates, Mickey Hallam, who was killed on the railway. I know it, his death always upset your father. I was wondering if you could speak about that, about Mickey's relationship to your father all his life. Yes. Uh, and Mickey Hallam was uh, one of my father's best friends. Um, he was very <coughs> ill and he was in what passed for a hospital in the camp. And he was dragged out um, uh, and beaten um, on a trumped up charge uh, because some other men had, um, who were supposedly under a work gang he was in charge of, um, had skived off for the day. 
and uh, they assembled the men in a parade and they beat, beat him to death in front of them. Um, uh, that story really forms the centre of the, novel, the, the aspect of the novel that deals with the prisoner of war camps. Um, and I guess that was... I, I don't, it, it always interested me why, when there were so many deaths, that one was the one that upset my father the most. But it, um, uh, I, you know, there were some very pointless deaths, but there was something more pointless and, and inexplicable, completely inexplicable about it. There was, I think in the end, it, it was a godless universe where men died for no reason, that that was a terrible thing. And, and that was the most inexplicable of all those inexplicable deaths. Um, he had another friend who, who did die um, in the Benjo, the big pit toilets, who was very sick and fell in one of them and drowned. I mean, they were just the most saddest, wretchedest deaths that you could wish upon a human being. But I think the more I thought about it, I thought there must be something so terrible to have to, to, to be a, a young man watching other men destroy a man and not be able to do anything to alter that destiny. That, that, that there's something so horrific about that and, and you must repress everything within you and, and your great battle at that moment must be to not feel because if you feel it will destroy you at that moment. Um, beyond that, I, I don't know. I never dared ask my father, but um, um, nothing, um, yeah, nothing made him sadder. I think, um, Richard, you've done your father proud with this book, and um, Richard will be up the back signing copies, and um, you should buy it tonight. And um, <laughs> Thank him for being with us this evening. Thank you, Romana.